Magnetic resonance imaging, or simply MRI, is a technique that is commonly used in the field of medicine and it comes from the field of nuclear physics and it uses a concept known as nuclear magnetic resonance. Now if you don't know what NMR is, go back and watch my lecture on NMR. In that lecture, we basically build a foundation that we're going to need to use to help us understand how magnetic resonance imaging actually works. So recall that any proton has positive charge and that positive charge basically spins on its side and as it spins it creates a magnetic dipole moment for that proton. So one way to model a proton is to think of the proton as being a sphere that is composed of many positive electric current loops that are stacked on top of one another and combining all the magnetic dipole moments of all all these current loops gives us the magnetic dipole moment for our proton which is given by this equation where the mu b is a constant known as the Bohr magneton. Now, actually, there are two ways that the positive charge of a proton can spin. So we can either have our positive charge spinning this way, which creates a magnetic dipole moment that points along this direction, or we can have positive charge that's spinning this way, in which case our magnetic dipole moment points downward along this axis. So if there is no magnetic field present, the energies of the these two spins is exactly the same. So this is known as spin up and this is known as spin down. So their energies is the same as long as there is no external magnetic field. However, what happens when we flip on that external magnetic field? So let's suppose we flip on our external magnetic field B that is static, meaning it doesn't change over time. It remains constant and uniform. So let's suppose our B, the magnetic field, points upward along the Y axis. So we have Y axis, X axis, and the Z axis is coming out of the board. Well, whenever we take a magnetic dipole moment mu and we place it into a magnetic field, that magnetic field will create a torque that will act on our magnetic dipole moment and will try to orient that magnetic dipole moment along the same axis as our magnetic field lines. So we can imagine that this is our magnetic field line, this is our magnetic dipole moment, and this magnetic field line will tend to create a torque that will act on this magnetic dipole moment and will orient it along the same axis as the magnetic field lines. So basically what will happen here, this magnetic field will tend to act, will tend to create a torque that will tend to align the magnetic dipole moment along the same axis. However, because the proton has an angular momentum, that means that our magnetic field will not be able to exactly align the magnetic dipole moment along this magnetic field line. Instead, what will happen is our proton or our magnetic dipole moment of the proton will process about an axis known as the precession axis. So if this is our magnetic dipole moment of the proton, the proton will follow this pathway. It will process about this axis. So notice the precession axis is parallel to our magnetic field line. So once again, when a proton is placed into an external magnetic field, it will feel a torque that will tend to orient the magnetic dipole moment along the same axis as the magnetic field lines. But the angular momentum of that proton will keep it from aligning exactly and the magnetic dipole moment will end up processing about this axis known as our precession axis and the frequency of precession is known as the Larmor frequency. So now let's suppose we are in this situation. Oh, by the way, so because earlier we said our spin can have two different spins, either a spin up or a spin down, when there is no magnetic field, these two have the same energies. However, as soon as we turn on that static magnetic field,
these two basically process this processes about this axis as shown in this situation and when this takes place it actually loses a certain amount of energy and it becomes more stable however the spin down actually gains that same amount of energy so it increases in energy so when we go from no elect no magnetic field to a static magnetic field B what happens is in this case the energy of these two spins was exactly the same but when we turn on our external magnetic field the Zeeman effect takes place the, uh, the Zeeman effect simply means there will be a splitting in energy the spin up will be lower in energy and the spin down will be higher in energy so now let's suppose once we turn on our static magnetic field and the proton begins to process, let's direct an electromagnetic wave, a pulse, at our proton. What will happen then? Well, the electromagnetic wave will carry an electric field that oscillates and a magnetic field that is perpendicular that also oscillates. So let's omit that electric field for simplification purposes. Let's only examine our oscillating or alternating magnetic field. So this is our alternating magnetic field and it's oscillating along the x-z axis where this is the x-axis and the z-axis is coming out of the board. So in this location our magnetic field of the electromagnetic wave points outward. In this particular lo uh, location our magnetic field points inward. So we have this changing magnetic field and as a result of the change in magnetic field when it collides with the proton it will basically flatten out the precession of our proton and that's because of the following reason. So let's look at this particular location on the electromagnetic wave. In this location notice that as we go around this location our magnetic field increases, it reaches a maximum and then it begins begins to decrease. So when our magnetic field interacts, what happens is the magnetic field points this way out of the board and our precession axis looks something like this. So basically the magnetic dipole moment will want to orient itself along this magnetic field that points outward and so it will tend to align itself and so the precession will flatten out as a result. Now when we go to the back side of the electromagnetic field, our magnetic field lines basically switch directions. They now point out uh, uh, inward and so that means our precession will not only flatten out in the forward direction, it will also flatten out in the reverse direction. And so in this case the precession looked like this. In this case the precession will be much more flattened out when we send this electromagnetic pulse. But notice this is not the only type of a precession that we we can have. We can also have a spin down precession and the same thing can be said about the spin down. So basically it will orient itself and the precession will flatten out for this particular case as well. Now, what happens if the frequency of this electromagnetic pulse is just the right frequency so that when this interacts with this type of precession, the spin up precession, this proton gains enough energy to actually jump from the lower in energy quantum state, the spin up quantum state, to the spin down quantum state, the higher in energy. So if the frequency is just right of the electromagnetic poles, we give the spin up protons enough energy to transition to the spin down state. And so now all our protons in that region are basically spinning down and are oriented along the following axis. So if we imagine all the protons within this region, we flip on our magnetic field that is static, this takes place. And then we send our electromagnetic pulse with just the right frequency, now all our protons that were spin up are now spin down. So all the protons in that region are spinning down as shown in this diagram.
So how exactly can we apply this idea to form the technique known as, mag known as magnetic resonance imaging, which basically is a technique that is used on humans. So everything we have discussed so far, we have discussed about protons, but this holds true for nuclei of atoms as well, because nuclei of atoms have protons inside the nucleus. So, the human body consists mostly of water which contains the hydrogen nuclei. So water contains H, H atoms. And it turns out that hydrogen nuclei have the strongest NMR or nuclear magnetic resonance signal. So they basically readily observe this phenomenon. So how exactly does the MRI machine actually work? Well, it follows everything we have discussed up to this point. So the MRI machine contains large magnetic coils that create a very large static magnetic field. So this is our MRI machine. We place the person on our bed and we move the bed into this MRI machine that contains those large coils. We turn on those coils. It creates a large magnetic field, usually from one Tesla to five Teslas, and it's a static magnetic field. It is not changing. Now, a second set of coils can create our electromagnetic pulse that we discussed earlier. And this electromagnetic pulse is usually known as the radio frequency pulse or simply RF pulse. For that purpose, these coils are sometimes known as the RF coils. So, as we discussed previously, when the RF pulse is emitted, the spin up nuclei, the hydrogen nuclei inside our body that are spinning up can now gain enough energy if the frequency is just right and they transition to the spin down state. So now all the nuclei, all the hydrogen atoms in that section of the body are basically spinning down and are processing and are flying tightening out their precession as described in this diagram because the frequency of the electromagnetic pulse is just right. Now, when we turn off the magnetic fields, all the nuclei that were spinning down basically return to their spin-up state in the process, releasing photons of energy. And these photons have varying intensities, different intensities. And so we can basically monitor these photons that are released as a result of the spin down, going back to spin up. and we can construct an image of this on a computer. Now we see <coughs> that the higher the hydrogen density is in a certain region of the body, the more intensity we will have and so the brighter that section will appear on the screen. So we see what the MRI machine actually does is it determines the density of hydrogen atoms in a certain part of the body. Now the question is, how exactly do we know from which location does a given photon of energy actually come from? How do we know that the photon of energy, for example, comes from this section of the body and not from this section? Well, actually what happens is the MRI machine has a third magnetic field. So that magnetic field, when turned on, creates a magnetic field gradient. That means as we move the person about our MRI machine, the magnetic field changes. So basically, we, if we begin on this location, Let's say the magnetic field is one Tesla. Here, the magnetic field could be two Teslas, three Teslas, four Teslas, and so on. Now, recall that the energy carried by the photon is proportional to the magnetic field. So, this means that our magnetic field determines the amount of energy that is gained by that proton and only specific values 
for our magnetic field will correspond to the proton gaining enough energy to go from spin up to spin down. So let's say our magnetic field has to be two Teslas for our spin ups to go to spin down. And that means if we have a gradient, if our magnetic field strength changes when we go from one location to a different location in the body, then that means if this region of the body corresponds to two Teslas, only this region will contain a magnetic field that is great enough for our spin-up nuclei to all transition to the spin-down state. And only nuclei in this region will have the spin-down. And when we turn off that magnetic field, all the nuclei in this section of the body will return back to their spin-up state, releasing photons of energy. And now we know that only this section released all that energy. So that's basically how our MRI machine works. It uses the principle known as the nuclear magnetic resonance that we discussed in this section.